Hello. This doesn't work. That's all right. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, all the co-authors and uh, industry partners to contribute this project. So the project is about uh, settling, consolidation, and desiccation of bauxite residue after a combination of physical and chemical treatments. We've been talking about drying this morning for a long time, and this is actually part of this. So um, the background of the project is about uh, bauxite residue. It's basically a waste after a bioprocess that produces alumina. It is usually being transmitted to a tailing storage facility uh, at the slurry with 25% solids. And because it's fine material, and um, it also has a very low hydraulic conductivity, so as a result, um, the settling process is very, very slow. And the consolidation is also very poor because of the low hydraulic conductivity that dissipate fully the excess pore water pressure. And if it desiccates, imagine what happens during the toothpaste um, drying. So you will see that the, uh, the surface gets coated and then the underneath is completely uh, wet. So this happens exactly to bauxite residue. There are processes we're talking about to improve this process. One of them is actually farming. So you can do amp rolling at high moisture content and then dozering at the low moisture content. But what if you don't have a large footprint? So some of the processes are proposed um, to improve its, um, uh, its, uh, its strength. So that includes um, adding flash ash and flo flocculants. So this could lump all the particles all together, so that may increase the hydraulic conductivity. The second is that we can uh, do the filtration. So the filtration will reduce the, um, the water mass, and as a result, um, the amount of water put into the tailing storage facility will be much less. And the third thing is um, the filtration actually have a lot of m fine materials lost. And if that material is lost, then the hydraulic conductivity might be increased. So we don't know. And the final thing is that um, uh, the bauxite residue is relatively alkalinic. So it has to be uh, either diluted or neutralized, which could potentially reduce pH. But does it change the uh, geotechnical or hydrological behavior? We don't know. So the scope of the project is to basically understand how the combination of this physical and chemical method may change the uh, behavior of the residues. So the next slide is basically a list of the samples. So we got um, the control samples here. So it, is, it was subjected to ash flocculant, no caustic, seawater neutralization, and no filtration and repalping. Whereas the rest of the samples here is basically the combination of different methods. So the method hatched in blue means that it's the same as the control sample. Where it's white, that means it's different. So one of the clear things is that uh, the control sample has subjected no, no filtration and repalping, where the rest of them has. And the rest of them is just a combination of these chemical and uh, addictives. So what is the difference? Number one. If you have conducted uh, the filtration and repulping, you see the percentage of solids increased from 25, 27% by solids by mass to around 40%. And the gravimetric water content definitely reduced as a result of that, it's correlated. But if we look further, so if you add acid, let's say acid, acid, and then the pH actually becomes uh, in, uh, relatively neutral whereas the rest of the material still are quite alkalinic, except for the control, which is around eight. So how about the rest of the material, uh, the MEP processes? We don't really see a significant impact on how ash flocculant and caustic dilution influence the initial conditions. So at least this is what the sample has been received. So we basically go through this series of um, uh, lab testing to identify what is actually the differences. So we basically look at the Otterberg limits. So the control is right in the middle. It has a liquid limit of 80%, and the plastic index is about um, 25%. So if you look at uh, how the data is being spread around, yes, it has slightly difference, but nevertheless, it's all being considered as MH, which means that uh, it's actually uh, rich in seals and clay with a very high plasticity. Does it really change the material from A to B? Not really. Now, let's move on.
well, try to figure out what really is the difference after this treatment. Now, particle size distribution, we've got clay, seal, and sand. So look at the clay proportion. It basically changed from 50% to 80%. And if we look at the sand proportion, I think the maximum proportion is about 7%, and the rest of them are sealed. Do you think that's different as a result of these processes? I would say the difference is actually induced by the variation of the upstream feed, right? So not big difference. We keep going. Um, so we carried out the settling, and uh, to be able to identify what really is the difference, so we started to differentiate the samples. So the, we get two groups. One is to start with 25% solids. The top is starting with 35% solids. And they behave also quite similar. So uh, overall, it settles in a week's time. And then the uh, final uh, solid concentration is around 35 if we start from 25. Instead, if we start from 35 to um, percent solids, and then it basically ends up around 37%. Um, so there is only one that appears to be different as compared to them. We believe that this is actually not induced by the treatment because the difference between these and the rest is just uh, adding pH to neutralize the pH. We don't believe this is actually the reason. Again, same. Now, we basically use out all our gears to identify what is the difference. So uh, we need to basically try to twist the ways how we treat uh, the carrier uh, to, to sample to, to analyze the samples. So this is actually a desiccation basin. So the, this basin is aimed to dry up the sample. Um, the sample is being dissipated in, uh, deposited into this basin uh, at the initial condition, and then it is allowed to dry by these fans. So the weight loss is able to record by these load cells. Uh, the scales, and also we've got um, moisture and suction sensor within this um, basin to measure the moisture and suction change. So there's a redundancy. We get some moisture changed from the scales, but also getting from the uh, sensors. The other thing we installed is basically the uh, cameras that is able to tell you how it gets settled and how it cracks and how the salts uh, is distributed on the surface. So again, let's look at the video. The video basically show um, the overall processes. So bear in mind that the x-axis is gravimetric water content. So if it's high, it's on the right-hand side. If it's low, it's on the left-hand side. So, the, so as you can see that um, over the drying process, it started cracking. So control is actually the first column. So it started cracking and the cracking becomes uh, more, and then later on it stops because it's lower than uh, the shrinkage limit. If you look at the evaporation rate, you, it starts to very high, and then later on drops down as a result of um, uh, limited water. And if you look at the moisture content over time, basically at the beginning when it starts um, uh, losing moisture, there's not much change of moisture content, but later on as sample gets dried, it basically reduced to zero. The suction uh, increase hand by hand with the moisture. So um, at the critical point, it started building up uh, to a level that is completely able to desiccate the sample. And we also um, use the uh, optical methods to identify how much settlement or um, shrinkage is taking place. So this vertical and the horizontal variation identifies that uh, the total density, af the density after the completely dry comes up to 1.5 tons per meter cube. So if we compare the control with the rest of the samples, just look at the pattern. Are they similar? Yes, they are very, very similar as well. So using this uh, basin test still doesn't tell the differences. Now we start to scratch our heads. OK, what is really the difference? Well, why don't we just give it a try outdoors and see if there's any differences? So what we did is to construct those large columns. So these columns are exposed to the atmosphere, and it has a height of 1.4 meters in height, 0.2 meters in diameter, and it was constructed by three sections. The reason we need to do that is because if you make it relatively deep, you wouldn't be able to use any tools to scoop the tailings out, or you know, it's, it's becoming very difficult to handle. Um, and also, we um, 
seal them at the bottom because um, the red mud is relatively low permeability, so the bottom leakage would be quite limited. But we could also have a drainage out to see how much leachate comes out. Um, it was instrumented by quite a few sensors, so um, for this case it's particularly moisture and suction sensors, and has a camera facing the top to see basically the settlement, the cracking, and also the uh, salt accumulations. Uh, finally, we basically set up a weather station, so the weather station is able to measure potential evapotranspiration rate, and if you know the moisture content near the surface, you are actually able to work out actual evapotranspiration and the rainfall. So you end up with a simple mass balance. The total in minus total out is equal to the storage change. So we can see how much water loss is taking place within there. So this instrumentation is not only used in this outdoor um, condition, in sort of outdoor laboratory condition, but it's also being used in tailing storage facility, um, uh, a cover, a cover monitoring, and also alluvial system monitoring. So uh, it's quite applicable to the wild conditions as well. Now, we got a big video here. It's quite a lot of information, but I try to uh, go through one by one. I think uh, the one that is most clear is the ones that you see the column start of settling. And these are two columns here is the control. The control has got 25% solids. And the uh, B is actually the uh, one after the filtration and repulping. So the initial solids content is actually 45% by mass. Now, these two have in very different initial condition. But if you look at the amount of settlement, are they the same? Well, this graph actually tells you it's going exactly the same pattern. The reason why I draw this vertical line here is because we actually add slurry tailings there to emulate a future deposition. And still, you see these two graphs are exactly the same. Now, again, go back, key summary, 25% solids here. 45% solid there, and they settle in the same manner. So why there are no more water coming out from these 25% solids, given that they have more water there? Well, we, we started to use the moisture sensor and the rest to tell. So these two graphs are basically degree of saturation over depth. So zero means is light, and then blue is, is green. So you see at the very beginning, there's no moisture loss. And later on, because of the sun, it started drying. But what, drying, what, what um, sample actually dried more as compared to the other? The SPO9 actually has got the unsaturated zone depth roughly 900 millimeters. This is what? Only 300. Why there's a difference? Remember, this one starts with 45% solids. So it has a relatively large dry density. So the capillary forces are stronger as compared to the control sample. So you could consider this is more or less like a clay, but this is like loose clay. So loose clay, poor capillary forces, and as a result, relatively smaller uh, uh, unsaturated zone. The suction basically tells a very, very similar story. So if it's blue, that means it's low suction. If it's red, it means high suction. So was, as we can see that um, the drying for the control sample is only taking place near the surface. So the unsaturated zone is about 300 millimeters. But if we look at the, um, the, the treated sample, the thickness can actually go 600 millimeters. So again, it's an indication of um, stronger capillary forces. Now, another important thing. So let's look at the result after this vertical line. This is the moment we add slurries on top of the dry sample. See the moisture sensor differences? Is there any dry wetting taking place for the um, SPO9 sample, which is um, uh, the field 45% solids initial condition? No, actually the wetting material is perched on top rather than wet underneath. What does that mean? So that really means that this particular sample has been consolidated very well due to the desiccation behavior. So it becomes more or less like a brick. And in that case, if you got the wet sample sitting on top of it, it becomes so difficult to uh, infiltrate through so that the moisture content actually stays as a dry condition. Instead, if we look at the control sample, given the underneath is still very, very wet. So when we um, deposit it, 
the top layer gets wet almost instantaneously. Well, if we look at the suction, it basically tells the same story. The, the process we haven't identified, we haven't done is actually compare the soil water retention curve uh, measured from in situ sensors with the, sensor, with the soil water retention curve we can get from the laboratory. Maybe they actually collapse, maybe they change because of the density change. So a list of the conclusions here. From the lab testing, the residue remain to the, be the same material after proposed uh, treatments, unfortunately. Um, after deposition, sample with different initial sol uh, solid content settles in a very similar way. This is also being confirmed. Sample with a higher initial solid content tends to de develop deeper unsaturated zone with lower hydraulic conductivity. And the final thing is, this is very critical, the characterization of the residue should consider not only their laboratory testing result, but also their in situ behavior. Thank you very much.